Hello again, church. It's great to be with you once again. And for those of you who are watching who are not part of Lavington Vineyard Church, my name is Jeremy, and I have the honor of serving as one of the pastors here. In Dr. Martin Luther King's famous, now famous, letter, letter from Birmingham jail, he takes the church and its leaders to task, especially in the southern United States. Well, he takes them to task for their complete lack of understanding about the actual godly aims that he and other civil rights leaders had in coming to the city of Birmingham, Alabama in the 1960s. And he takes them to task for their complacency and their apathy and how their silence in the face of grave injustices revealed the, the true state of their hearts and it actually brought the church into disrepute. And he says to them, I am in Birmingham. You see, because by the way, they had labeled him an outsider. Why are you here stirring up trouble? And he said, I'm here in Birmingham because injustice is here. And then in one of the most famous lines from this famous letter, he said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. One particular line from this letter stuck out at me as I read it this week. He said, he writes, you deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham. But your statement, I am sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. Listen to that again. Fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. Well, and I think for us now, almost 60 years later, in our context, that word concern really stuck out to me. I think for many, if not most, if not all of us, in the face of social injustice, we are too often guilty of complacency and analysis paralysis. So let me say that again. In the face of social injustice, we are too often guilty of analysis paralysis, more on that later, and complacency. So what this can look like is that we feel overwhelmed by the sheer volume and the weight of it all. And so we don't do anything. We assume that someone else is doing it. Someone else is addressing it. Or we don't know how to learn and to take up the next step. It's what Dr. King called sincere ignorance. But it's just as dangerous. Well, we could be good at analyzing and discussing the problem, but then we never do anything about it. That's the analysis paralysis. We can go to a cocktail party or a garden party and talk all about the problem and how knowledgeable we are, but we overanalyze, we overthink it, and so then we never get around to actually doing anything. We get stuck because there's just too much injustice in the world. We can easily think, I've got enough problems of my own including ones caused by those injustices. And so I just got to get through each day. It can be hard to get off the couch. You could say, I'd love to care, but it's hard to get off the couch and actually do something. Well, we don't have to stay stuck like that, church. There is a way to move beyond paralysis and complacency and into action. And I think the book of Amos and the Minor Prophets in the Old Testament has a lot to say. This is a word that we need for our situation. Well, for us today, thousands of years later, I think at the very heart of it and why we have hope in the face of a world of such injustice is that we have the Holy Spirit. For us genuine believers, born again by the Holy Spirit, we have that Spirit who brings transformation. Well, today we continue in our series in the Minor Prophets. And church, I don't know about you, but one thing that has struck me for the first time ever in reading and rereading and listening to the Minor Prophets is the focus on the heart. So whether it's two weeks ago in Hosea or last week what Ben brought out from Joel is the focus on the heart and how the idolatry and the injustice starts in the heart. Well, Amos, just a little background about him, he prophesied to both the northern and the southern kingdoms, Israel and Judah, back in around 760 B.C. Amos is one of the more interesting prophets, I think, because he, his calling 
is from a shepherd, which was his profession, if you will, to now a prophet. And in his prophetic role, he was actually more of what you would call a covenant lawyer. So throughout the Minor Prophets, you see this idea of a covenant lawsuit being brought to God's people because they had broken the covenant. So these accusations come and the pronouncements of judgment. And so Amos, like others, in his role as prophet, is a lot more like a covenant lawyer. Well, when God, who is called the Lord God Almighty by Amos, when he speaks through Amos, it's like this. The Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. So God, through the shepherd-turned-prophet Amos, has a strong message for his people. And it consists of three key messages. The first one is that God's people are guilty of idolatry and injustice. Idolatry and injustice. The two go hand in hand. So listen to this from Isaiah, excuse me, Amos chapter 5, right in the middle of the book. He says, now brace yourself for this. He says, I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I will have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. Did you bring me sacrifices and offerings 40 years in the wilderness, people of Israel? You have lifted up the shrine of your king, the pedestal of your idols, the star of your God, which you made for yourselves. Therefore, I will send you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is God Almighty. So again, don't miss there the link between idolatry and injustice. And if you think about it, that link actually makes a lot of sense. Going back to Moses in Deuteronomy and pointing forward to what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians. Listen, if demons are are ultimately behind our idols, like they are fooling, they are blinding the minds of unbelievers to actually think that these idols are real. If demons are ultimately behind our idols, then humans who have surrendered to those idols would naturally want to oppress and destroy other humans. That's the business of Satan and his minions. And so indulging in idolatry opens the door to to play a part in that wickedness. Well, verse 24, I'm sure you've heard that before. And of course, Dr. King, in that famous letter, echoed those words. Listen to it again. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. May it be so, church, in Nairobi and in Kenya and beyond. So, in this link between idolatry and injustice, listen to what came before, just before that part, about their false worship. Verse 10 of chapter 5. Amos writes, There are those who hate the one who upholds justice in court and detest the one who tells the truth. You levy a straw tax on the poor and impose a tax on their grain. Therefore, though you have built stone mansions, you will not live in them. Though you have planted lush vineyards, you will not drink their wine. There are those who, excuse me, for I know how many are your offenses. And how great your sins. There are those who oppress the innocent and take bribes and deprive the poor of justice in the courts. Therefore, the prudent keep quiet in such times, for the times are evil. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you, just as you say he is. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. Now, what he means by there with the the remnant of Joseph is just a reference to God's people, the people of Israel. And it's going to come up a little bit later. But we love to see justice in the courts, don't we? I don't know about you, but I love these courtroom dramas or movies that where injustice in the courtroom and in the entire film is so strong that it just gets in your nostrils and makes you sick. But then in those climactic scenes when justice enters the courtroom, like that ever-flowing river and 
stream. It's powerful, isn't it? So if you haven't seen it yet, go watch a recent film like Just Mercy or an older film called A Civil Action because we love to see justice actually come forth. So you may be sitting there thinking, okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I personally am not guilty of blatant acts of injustice, of corruption, of oppression. So I'm not sure what this has to do with me. Well, that, that may be true. But I wonder if it's possible, like many Israelites, like me, sadly, at times, that you've become complacent. So the second message that Amos has for God's people is that they are guilty of complacency. So in chapter 6, he says, Woe to you who are complacent in Zion, and to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria, you notable men of the foremost nation to whom the people of Israel come. You lie on beds adorned with ivory and lounge on your couches. You dine on choice lambs and fattened calves. You strum away on your harps like David and improvise on musical instruments. You drink wine by the bowlful and use the finest lotions, but you do not grieve over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, you will be among the first to go into exile. Your feasting and lounging will end. Excuse me. Look again there at verse 6. Lack of concern. Oh, these people are living large. They are drinking wine by the bowlful, using the finest lotions. And yet what? They do not grieve. The people of God, the the nation is in ruins because of their idolatry and injustice. And they're not grieving. There's no concern. So the people are living large, but they're not caring, or at least their lack of grief shows their complacency. Well, this is heavy heavy stuff, church. Amos is a heavy book. The minor prophets are all heavy. But the Lord loves His people and His creation enough to address idolatry and injustice. He's going to take it head on. He loves His people and His creation too much to not take it head on. He cares about our hearts. And so there's hope. And so if you're feeling any degree of heaviness about all of this stuff from Amos, look at this next truth from the prophet. So the third message to God's people is that guilty people are restored by the shepherd. Guilty people are restored by the shepherd. See, because that lion who roars from Zion, that lion ultimately is also the lamb. The lamb who laid down his life to make it possible to restore his people. And so, yes, ultimately he will do that. And listen to chapter 9, near the end of the book. It says, In that day I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins and will rebuild it as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. I love that. You don't even have to love wine to love that. And I will bring my people back from Israel, excuse me, from exile. I will bring my people Israel back from exile. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Why don't you love these rich verses about vineyards and gardens, wine and fruit? These are symbols of restoration pointing forward to that great banquet. You see, yes, this is pointing forward to the time when they're brought back from exile. But even more, it is pointing forward to what the prophet Isaiah talked about, of that great banquet to come with well-aged wine, the choicest of meats and the finest of wines, when God will finally and fully restore His people. 
So the hard-hitting reality, church, is that God's people are guilty of idolatry and injustice, complacency on top of that. And yet in the midst of it all is that our, in our sin, our God is the good shepherd who restores the guilty, restores wayward people. And so, yeah, it's hard to get off the couch, isn't it? The easy couch of complacency and apathy. We prefer that other people address social injustice. But you see, hard truths have to be faced head on. God's people have been guilty of idolatry and injustice. They have not grieved over injustice and allowed their hearts to be stirred. And yet we have this one who changes hearts and sends us out by his spirit. So what we're going to do now is just talk about taking one step in one area. See, there may be lots of ways that God would call you to step out. And individually, as followers of Jesus, we need to follow the voice of the Spirit in response to this word to do that. But as a church family, corporately as a body, there's a a specific area where we want to address an injustice. And so we want to talk to you about that now. So church, I'm now joined by Sunny Uma who's part of our church family. Sonny started the Give Back Hope initiative, which he's, he could tell us a little bit more about in a bit. But Sonny is joining me today, and by the way, we're, we're here with plenty of distance between us in my garden. But Sonny's here with me today to talk about the system of children's homes in Kenya and how our response as a church is, called something, is something called family reunification and strengthening. It's a mouthful. We tend to call it FRS, okay? Family Reunification and Strengthening. In that letter by Dr. King, he quotes a theologian named Reinhold Niebuhr, who says that groups tend to be more immoral than individuals. Well, I think that's even more true for systems. And so we want to talk to you today about one particular system in Kenya and how, as a system, it's actually become immoral and unjust. So it's a system that actually needs to be dismantled over time. And as a church, we want to be part of that dismantling in whatever way we can, working with Kenyans on the ground who are part of this fight against injustice. So let me tell you a little bit before I bring in Sonny, let me tell you a little bit about how as a church we landed on this emphasis, how as elders, our hearts were stirred in this area for our missional engagement in Nairobi. So if you've been around LVC long enough, you'll know that Lavington Vineyard Church is made up of a lot of different kinds of people. And I think we're a kind of people who are seeking a home. People seeking a home. I think this captures more than anything our identity as a church made up of people of 25 nationalities, all kinds of different backgrounds. And so whether Kenyans or expats, LVC has become a home to many. It's a place to belong. It's a people gathered around a savior who redefined family. So let me read this to you from our forthcoming website to help frame why it is what we're doing, what we're talking about today. As a community of Christ followers seeking our true home, we believe that children deserve to grow up in a loving home with a real family. We therefore seek to partner with those who desire to get children on the streets and children in in institutional homes back into actual homes with actual families. Though many children's homes begin with good intentions, we are convinced by the data that shows that kids flourish best in actual homes and not institutions. Starting in 2020, it's hard to believe we're now in November 2020, LVC will be establishing partnerships with local community-based organizations, CBOs, that are working on the FRS issue, both in preparing children to reintegrate back into a home and strengthening the families that will receive them. So that's what we're talking about today, and I'm excited to have Sunny join me, who is quite an expert on this topic. And so, Sunny, welcome. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for joining. Even on, on late notice, I really appreciate you coming to share your heart and your expertise, brother. Yeah. So, Sonny, first of all, how have you been coping during this pandemic? Um, it has been good. Um, since it just caught us off guard, we have to work with it the way it is. So, yeah. 
so far so good. Okay, and how long have you been part of LVC? LVC, now this is my first year, okay. full year. Right, yeah. all right. Well, we're so glad to have you. And so tell us a little more, Sonny, about your story and then even your organization, Give Back Hope Initiative. Thank you so much. So my name is Sonny Oma, a member of LVC. Um, happened to be born in Kangemi, uh, one of the informal settlements. And uh, life at the beginning wasn't that easier. And my family, my parents were, would not be in a were not in a position to cater for us. Like, um, so like take us to school, uh, provide food. So what resulted is us, me and my brother joining the street. And uh, by being in the streets, uh, well-wishers were coming and uh, rescuing us from there. I was rescued twice. Mm. On the first one, I escaped from the home. Mm. But now the second one, I was taken to a children's home where the, the guard at the home spo knew us, like um, had seen us with our mom. So he went to the social worker in the institution and shared that, hey, these two boys, I know they are families. And, uh, it happened that our home was just close by the home. And uh, so we were taken back to the home, but the institution allowed us to continue like getting education. We were enrolled in child sponsorship programs that enabled us get food and uh, education. Mm -hmm. And so after finishing my education through the organization, I had this feeling and, uh, of starting my own organization mm -hmm. just to give back to the communities, uh, more so to the children that are on the street. Uh, that embarked me to starting the organization by the name Give Back Hope Initiative. Mm. That is currently we are doing feeding programs and not just feeding programs, but we are able to reunify the street children back into their families. Mm. And it's just amazing seeing the way the families uh, welcome them back to the community mm. and into their families. Mm. Because if you find out like there are kids in the street with mere reason, like there is one who lost a credit of 20 shillings and was fearful of the mom will, will punish him. Mm. So he decided to run on the street. And so the moment I took the boy back home, the mom was so happy and mm. was like, my child was in the street for a whole year just because of wow. 20 shillings. Yeah. So that even touched me more in ensuring that I take as many children back into their families. Mm. Okay. Well, thank you for that, sharing your story and just again, so glad you're a part of our church family. Mm -hmm. So, Sonny, as I mentioned, we're talking about this system and thinking about how systems can take on a life of their own. As a church, we want to avoid complacency and actually address what's there. But to, to get to an action step for us and what we could do as a church body, let's help people understand the system. So describe the system for, it, for us as it is now mm -hmm. and why it's unjust. So the system as it is right now is like if they if there is any child, for instance, let me use the street. If there is any child like let's say below 10 years is found on the street, the first place that child will be taken is in an institution. And this mm. institution, we may say it's a children's home where else the child, there is nobody who is going to follow up and see what is the cause of this child being on the street. Uh, the other action is maybe a child, one of the parents dies or passed on. And then the community is just there to be like, if the child is an orphan, the only place that the child should be is in a children's home, mm. which again, maybe a child is denied opportunity to, that maybe he or she would have gotten while the family. Mm. And so the system is just like any child, whoever, like wherever the child is found, the only place, regardless of the reason, he's taken to a children's home, to an institution, okay. um, which really doesn't uh, address the issue why the child is maybe uh, loitering around. Okay. Yeah. Now, speaking of those children, sometimes, in fact, oftentimes, these children's homes are called orphanages. Yeah. But now one of the things, Church, that, to be clear on is that, you know, as Sonny knows from his expertise, but then many others who are working on this issue, is that the term orphanage is a misnomer, isn't it? Because something like, I don't know, 80 or 90 percent, some will say as high as 90 percent of children who are either on the street or in one of these institutions called often orphanages are not truly orphans. Yeah. They do have some, even if it's extended family, who were there who could accept them uh, if they were strengthened 
and if there was a process getting them back into that home. So is there anything else you would want to say about that, Sonny, about just that, that impression that many people have that these are orphans, so of course they need to be in some institution, right? Yeah, and that one, I felt it firsthand, especially in the children's home that uh, I went to school there. I had my classmate um, was perceived to be an orphan, but the moment uh, he was done with his uh, primary education, he came to realize like one year, late, uh, one year after, the mom was sick and then mom passed on and he, he was now broken the news that, hey, that was your mom. And he was like, I've been in this institution for more than eight years. You've never told me like I have a mom. Yeah. But so like the, fa the, 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 the child was found on the street, taken to a home. And then he knew like the, he was an orphan because most of the, the perception was children are in this home. Even when visitors come, mm. they are told like, hey, this is an orphan so that they can get uh, more donations or more PT and people would visit them mm. frequently. And so that was really, really painful mm. for my friend realizing like, hey, my family was out here and I was in an institution. Mm. And you know, as in an institution, like if it's food, you have to queue. Like you, it's mm. a survival for the fittest yeah. in, in there. So that is the, the assumption that people have, like children in, the, in, the, in those so-called orphanages have no family members, mm. which is wrong because mm. you can't tell me like a child would not would lack an uncle, a cousin, or even an extended family member. Yeah. So in one way or the other, they are there. And what we, we are lacking is people to mm. take an initiative to introduce this new aspect of, re of reunification mm. and be like, you may not be in a position to take care of this child, but as an institution, we will help you mm. come up with SMEs, businesses, and mm -hmm. see, we are, are we going to empower you so that you bring this child in a family setup? Okay. Thank you for that. So we know that unjust systems just don't come up on their own, right? That there are actually key players mm -hmm. in unjust systems who are actively working to perpetuate the system. Perhaps others who are unwittingly, just from their own cluelessness and ignorance, mm -hmm. don't realize they're perpetuating this. So could you just, as briefly as possible, talk about the kind of players, whether it's founders and directors of children's homes, mm -hmm. um, recruiters, who are helping get kids into these institutions, but then also donors from, let's just say the West, who give money towards these homes and without knowing it perhaps, keep an unjust system going. Um, thank you for that. And I think I would start with us, our religious leaders, mm -hmm. because um, most of the, these orphanages so-called, like most of them were, were found, founded in a religious, institution so that um, they may be w with a good heart be like this family is not able to support the the children let us take in because our members will be able to feed them but then as time goes by then they realize like hey this is kind of source of income because when people are coming in they are bringing in donations so unknowingly they found themselves like focusing more on now bringing more children and th using the children mm. to be part of the uh, uh, income generating mm. like uh, for the f facilities of every or running of the institution other people who are doing it un unknowingly are for instance as social workers, maybe somebody have gone to school and have been employed in an organization to be recruiting children. And you have told like, you will not pay you money if you don't bring kids in our institution. Mm -hmm. That is your role to go and look for children. So some, ta some of them comes out and even fo fo uh, forge or talk to the parent like, hey, mm -hmm. if I take your child in this organization, he will get sponsored, mm -hmm. he will get education. So you just say the child is, uh, often, mm. even like we have had so many cases of parents denying their children and saying like, oh, I know this is my, my distant family. The mom died, the father died, and there is no family. Where in real sense, he or she is the real parent. Mm. So because of that lack of knowledge, they, they're just doing it so that the children can, be, uh, can, be, uh, can, can get help. Uh, other people are our, let's say the police. Uh, or the county directors, they find like they find children uh, loitering around. It is their mandate. They feel like we are not supposed to let these children loiter here. Mm. Let's take them out of this 
these out of the streets and take them to these homes. <laughs> Whereas, again, yeah. the same, same analogy continues where they are now going to be used. And one thing that was painful is that when we were on that, uh, on the home, kids are just trained on how to welcome people. Mm. And just like when people come, you just praise them. You know, you, wow. you used now to like, even you in your mind, you'll be like, hey, so I'm just supposed to be receiving. Mm. And some people are coming with, with uh, gifts and stuff. Mm. But what sometimes steer out is those di directors. Some mm. may say like, for instance, I have a children's home. Mm. And yet I have children, but my kids are not in that home. Mm. Their kids, the director's kids are in a family setup. Right. But then you say, yes, you may have that passion. But if you really have the passion, like even your kids should mm. be sleeping with them in those dormitories, mm. should be eating with them. That is now what the disparity comes And in. so the institutions just keep on going, take up a life of their own. And some of those visitors you mentioned, the kids have to actually, you know, as someone described, perform for the visitors, yeah. right? They receive these gifts, they do, and they do dances and mm -hmm. play, play together, are actually oftentimes mission groups from the West, right, from the US, UK, Australia, wherever, who are funding these orphanages, right, and or the so-called orphanages, as they may think. And in what sense do, do you think many of them even have an awareness of the system as it really is? Uh, uh, for them, it might be difficult because like them, they may be doing it genuinely. They're supporting like this because the, 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 the information they get probably is like all oh, these kids are orphans. They don't have m fathers or mothers. But then th sometimes also it's just when they come, like the kids are pressured and like they are told what to say, what to do. Mm -hmm. And then it is just making them uh, feel like, like, worshipped or mm. something like you are valued so much and mm. it brings the disparity where if an African child see a, um, a, a, a Western person what comes in mind first is that mm. donation yep. like if I see you're white what I need to expect is something out from mm. you mm. which is a bad mentality that we need to unlearn it uh, as Kenyans mm. yeah well church let me say to us expats, right? Because they're Kenyans working on the ground, Kenyans who are involved in perpetuating the system. But as we're gonna talk about in a minute, those who are working on the ground to address the system and to try and dismantle it. But I wanna to speak to us as expats. So wherever we are from, in the West perhaps, where maybe we have been a part of churches or even now are connected to churches who don't have the awareness. And now it's up to us, church, to understand and then advocate and speak out. To say to these churches, there is a better way. And two other individuals in our congregation, Buchan Onyango and Gloria Kennedy, weren't able to be part of this discussion today, but I am coach, I've been coaching them through writing an essay that is gonna be, Lord willing, in a forthcoming book that's gonna be published, talking about short-term mission groups from the West and the impact they have in countries like Kenya and the two of them have written a powerful essay on this very issue that's going to be out there we trust in uh, the U.S. and beyond to really speak to Western churches to say we got to wake up and be aware that we are participating in an unjust system when we just perpetuate the cycle of these institutions and not focus on getting kids back into actual families and strengthening those families. Okay so Sunny, let's turn now for as briefly as we can, for the Kenyans in these CBOs, community-based organizations that are working on the ground, mm -hmm. what, what are they actually doing? What are the strategies to try and get kids back into actual homes? So, um, specifically here in Nairobi, um, being that I started the organization, the Give Back Hope Initiative, it is registered under the CBO, and uh, we came together, different organization under an umbrella called uh, RAGS, mm. uh, RAGS, where different uh, organizations working with children come together and speak in one voice. Mm. Because like, it's very hard for one organization or one individual to come and cut across all the, all the uh, 
institution and that are working with kids so what they are doing right now is there are some that are running the feeding program so if if i do feeding program you may also come in and help in reintegration so while mm -hmm. you're doing the feeding program you're able to interact with the child and see what are the causes what are the reasons that brought the child back mm -hmm. and through that we are able to to track them back to the year families mm. and uh, we realized that there is one of the kids we took back home but then realized like the challenge was poverty which again we we were like okay yes the problem is poverty you don't have food and the structures are, are poor that you cannot uh, live uh, in the family what we do is uh, we came up with a, with a plan of starting a child sponsorship program whereas we reach out to friends who are able to at least support the child mm. while he the, while the child is in the family mm. to be able to go to school and come back to to the family mm. and also the the parents we able to start a small business for them where they were selling some vegetables and on return at least every evening they would find something to feed the family mm. which was nice and i believe if different organizations do that they are able to take at least one mm. i know it is hard to take the 200,000 children who are on the street wow. at once yeah. but if we start somewhere i think it is come it will be encultured into us that mm. you see a child what comes to your mind is not rushing them to a children's mm. home but try and identify if he, the child is an orphan try and identify an extended family member and engage them train them and then they will, they will feel so comfortable being in a family. So what I'm hearing you say, Sonny, if I understand, is that even just those basic necessities, mm -hmm. I mean, food, education, clothing, like those basic things can mean the difference between a child being, in many ways, pulled into or sent into that system yeah. of being an institution. Yeah. Because that's basically the reason. Like, in as much as... In as much as the institution may be of help, especially, but they should not go beyond one year. Let, the, let there be just a halfway home, mm -hmm. where, for instance, Sony is uh, found on the street, and before they are taking, the, before I am taken to the, my my home, I can mm -hmm. be taken to a, a halfway home mm -hmm. where I am trained on ways to mm -hmm. cope up in a family setup. As the, as the organization or individuals are trying to also train my family so that they are able to welcome me back to the society and be like, hey, Sony did A, B, C, D, but mm -hmm. we are working to this, in this together. And also I am trained on this so that in a span of three or to six months, mm -hmm. Sony is able now to be reunified and mm -hmm. integrated back to the community, which will be smooth. Amen. Well, Sonny, what else would you like people to know what else would you like to say about this phrase? It's a big mouthful, family reunification and strengthening. What would you like people to, to know about that? Family reunification and strengthening is a key word. And it's a word that uh, we need as Kenyans and individuals all over the world because family unification are key mm. to help in terms of issues of immigration mm. where you will realize like, Part of the family is in one country, the other is in the other country, kids are, diff are, are separate. But when we talk about family unification, it is strengthening these families, bringing families together. And as the family of Christ, the way even Christ teaches us to be one family, to be mm. one unit, um, that we are not going to be separated. Mm. We are connected with, in, in blood so that it is not a way like one of your relative is in this side on the other on the other side mm. we need to come together and be like a family mm. and uh, we reunify all these kids who are in institution we are not saying institutions are not doing their part they are doing their part but kids are better in a family mm. setup so long term this is a system we want to see go away right we yeah. want to it's going to take time isn't it yeah so we church or wanting to take the next step to do our part in addressing this unju unjust system. So institutions aren't going to go away in the next month or next year. It's going to take time to see these children. So church, to do our part, recently we've met with a brand new team of people who want to help us as a church move forward in this area to partner with local organizations that are working on this issue. So that's going to mean some relationship building. Yes, even some financial partnership. And so I just want to highlight briefly, church, this is one area where as you give faithfully, 
in those ways that we've talked about from the New Testament, giving with intentionality, generosity, and joy. Yeah, it supports the operations of our church, but even more importantly, in many ways, I would say, is that we get to give and be a part of what God is doing to bring shalom to cities like Nairobi, to see unjust systems dismantled. And just like we've been talking about from the book of Amos, to be a part of what God is doing to bring restoration. So let's not be those who are guilty of complacency, church. Let's do what we can as a body to address this. So you're going to be hearing more uh, in the months ahead, but let's just be praying for this initiative. Let's be praying for Sonny and others in our church, like Buchan and Gloria, who are working on this issue. And so, Sonny, I'd like to just pray for you and just pray for us as a church as we take these next steps. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for this word through the prophet Amos. And Lord, even though it has been thousands of years since that was written, Lord, we see the bridge between his context and ours. Lord, we are surrounded by idolatry and injustice, idolatry in our own hearts, ways in which we've even unknowingly been part of unjust systems. Lord, bring us to a place of repentance and trust in you that you are the God who restores. And then, Lord, fill us up and send us out to be part of what you're doing in this city, in this country, and in this world. Lord, would you bless Sonny in the work of his hands to see stories more like his, Lord, to where you've redeemed him, you've restored him in so many ways. And Lord, now he's out there being a part of what you're doing in the city to reach these kids. So Lord, would you give us wisdom as a church? Would you give us boldness and vision and passion and even a prophetic voice, Lord, when many would be stubborn to see this system change for all kinds of reasons. Lord, would you give us boldness to speak into this system? Lord, to see many more kids restored to families. Lord, that they would then come to somehow know the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, we look forward to that day when your people are restored. There's a new heavens and a new earth and all of creation is redeemed. So we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Sonny, thank you again for being with us today in church. Let's step out and do what we can. And so, as we close, I want you, after this ends, to go in the show notes, go on the Facebook, click on the link to watch this song called God of Justice. And indeed, may the Lord fill us up and send us out. Thanks for joining once again. God bless you. Love you, church.